Welcome, everybody. If we haven't met before, my name is Kelly Sinclair, and I am the founder of Entrepreneur School and KS and Co, a uh, marketing and branding agency and uh, training company for entrepreneurs. And I am so excited about this platform that we created called Entrepreneur School, where we bring some amazing experts that I am blessed to know and have connected with from all around the world who have different skill sets and different expertise that you need to know as a emerging entrepreneur, as you're growing your business, as you're trying to figure out where to start and what is next, uh, we have the tools for you here. So we've had some really great speakers already on topics like content creation, how to manage your time effectively, productivity, branding and marketing, intuitive business decision making. And today we have the wonderful Lindsay White from High Voltage Leadership, who is going to talk to us all about hiring. And there's so much more to it than figuring out what the job description is and what the role looks like. But there's a huge piece and I'm sure she's going to touch on on getting yourself into like a CEO mindset to be able to actually feel ready to do it. Right. I, I know that um, if you're here, please put in the chat where you're from and what made you interested in coming to this conversation today and let us know how you found us as well, because I'm always curious to see. How, uh, how we're connecting with people from around the world. So Lindsay, uh, my dear friend, is based in Calgary, Alberta. So I'm, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of meeting her in person, um, in real human life, which is great, because sometimes we're just in these little boxes, right, <laughs> on a screen. Um, but she's a very sought after leadership coach and people operations consultant who believes that every business, no matter how small, deserves three things, which are great leadership, an impactful people strategy, and a culture that inspires. And I have to say, I'm not going to read the whole formal bio, but Lindsay has helped me personally on uh, figuring out how to uh, grow my own team and plan for that growth and think about it and get myself ready to finally admit that um, uh, that, <laughs> that I needed to stop doing everything by myself. So... <laughs> Welcome, it's Lindsay. Deal. It's a thing. It's a thing for solopreneurs. It's a thing, and it's a big step. And I'm happy to be here uh, to talk about tackling that that big first hire because um, it's an important one, right, Cal? Absolutely, yes. And yeah. it uh, and and like I think like the job or the job description. I just automatically said that, but like the description of this event said, it's not necessarily about the first like employee who maybe goes on a payroll and it has a, has a specific, um, you know, amount that you have to pay them every single month or two weeks, but, but just somebody who can help you, um, short-term, long-term flexible, all of those kinds of things. hundred percent. And the process and the strategy that we employ needs to be the same. Um, because ultimately it's about people. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to, we're, you know, we're going to go really deep on this today. And I've put in the chat, a link to, um, um, uh, the workbook. I created a workbook. It's got, um, all sorts of great stuff in it, tactical tools, uh, you know, great questions that you need to be asking space to think about pieces. And so I'll refer uh, to the workbook at moments in time um, throughout the presentation today. Kelly just popped it in there again. So that's awesome. Um, and welcome everybody. You know, glad you can join us and, and happy that there's people from various places. Uh, so what I'll do is I will jump into my presentation. And as Kelly said, we're, you know, I'm going to use the language um, team members. And that can mean a contractor, um, that can mean an employee, and it can be a combination of both. So I'll, I'll use that language, but you'll see there's places where we talk about employee. Um, again, the process that we're going to engage in, the strategy that we're going to use is going to be the same, whether we're going to hire someone who's working on contract or someone who is working out of our, our payroll. All right. Awesome. Welcome. We have someone we people from Alberta, Kelly, and we have someone joining us from the UK. Glad you're here with us. Um, and I will share awesome. my screen. 
Okay, here we go. All right, and I'm gonna hide this, hide floating controls. I'm gonna hide our faces. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes, it looks beautiful as always. And just one more note before we get rolling, um, please use the chat and please do that to uh, let everyone know where you're from um, and connect with people because we are here trying to build community as well as to learn. 100%, 100%. Awesome. So we're going to talk about record, report, <laughs> recruiting your first and here I have employee, but it's really your first team member. And it's really about recruiting a rock star, right? Like that's what we all want to do is we want to find someone that not only is going to bring their great skills and experience, but is really going to be a great fit. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is some really straightforward hiring strategies that are specifically for those of us that are solopreneurs and are looking to, to change that. Awesome. So if you haven't already, click on that link in uh, the chat box, because that's where you're going to find uh, your workbook. It's a Google Doc, um, you know, or feel free to just grab a pen and a, and a notebook if that works better for you today. And as Kelly said, I want you to own that chat and I will pause um, to ask uh, for comments and give you time for a little reflection as well. But Kelly's going to sort of man the chat and she'll let me know if there's some questions in there that we need to answer. So as Kelly said, I'm Lindsay White, and I am the founder and principal at High Voltage Leadership. And uh, what I do is I work with uh, female entrepreneurs and their teams, and I help incredible women just like you and I who want to be really fantastic leaders in their business. They want to build a really high-performing, highly engaged team. Um, and they want to build um, a workplace culture where people feel like they belong. Uh, because ultimately, when we have those three things in our small businesses, that is when we can contribute our best, our teams can contribute our best, we can serve our clients the most effectively, and we grow our businesses, we grow our revenue, and our bottom lines increase. So as Kelly said, this is my you know, sort of foundational belief, right? If we have great leadership, if we have an impactful people strategy, which recruitment is part of that people strategy, and then we create a culture that really inspires people, we are ultimately going to get uh, the best out of them. They're going to produce their very best work. Um, and that's when we all get to feel like what we do has a really big impact. And here's the other part of it. You know, recruitment does not have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complex because it can be intimidating, um, especially to those of us that are solopreneurs. But what it does need to be is well-planned and very intentionally executed. And I will admit here today, I am not a structure or process oriented person. I'm probably one of the least detail oriented humans you will ever you know, encounter. But when it comes to um, this very important aspect of bringing talent to our business, it is actually really crucial that we have a well laid out plan and that that recruitment plan connects ultimately back to our business strategy, right? And that's really what we want to do is we want to bring talent to the business that is going to help us execute on that business strategy. And that's really where we're going to start today is by talking about that. And then when we really intentionally execute, when we go through the steps and stages and we're really thoughtful about how we're doing that, ultimately what we get is a really great result, which is we find the right person, we get them into our business effectively, and then we get them up and running, right? We get them contributing as quickly and easily as possible. And ultimately that's where we really see accelerated growth. So the big question for a lot of the entrepreneurs that I work with, and Kelly will probably laugh because I think you know, this is something that we discussed for a while, is when is it time to hire? Now, if you look in the workbook, I've got a little decision sheet there, and it asks several questions. There's little check boxes. Um, and uh, when you have a moment, if you're looking at it right now, you can go through it. Yep, I'm, I'm feeling that. Yep, that's happening. Yep, got that. It'll give you an opportunity to reflect, but here's three of the most important things 
that I notice when I talk to entrepreneurs, these three things come up the most often, and they're great indicators that it is time. It is time to add someone to your business. So first of all, your important relationships are starting to suffer. And normally this is because you're becoming a bit of a workaholic, right? Now, we're all passionate about our businesses and we all like to work uh, in and with our clients. But if your important relationships are suffering, you know, this is your kids, your partner, you know, your important uh, people in your life, that's a pretty good indication it might be time uh, to bring someone into your business. When your business needs are starting to shift, so perhaps there's some pivoting happening, perhaps there's some really great growth happening. So if those shifts are starting to happen in your business, that is an indication that it might be time to hire. And it's also a great indication if you are feeling overwhelmed and exhausted, if you are really creeping up to some burnout, that is a great time to really start thinking about, is it time for me to add some talent here? Is it time for me to bring on a team member? And if it is time, there are three really simple steps in order to do this really effectively. The first is to have a really clear vision. And that's where we're going to start today. The second is to have a simple strategy. And then the third piece is to have a really great process. And again, this does not have to be complex. It does not have to be complicated. But we need to make sure that we have all these pieces in place so that we can execute effectively. And that means we're going to spend the least amount of time, but we're going to have the very best result. So first of all, your business plan. This is, you know, you've defined your why. You Maybe you've clarified some big goals. You've done a bit of a SWOT analysis. So you understand the changes and the challenges that are happening in your business. And you've recognized some opportunities or perhaps there's some talent or skill gaps that are going, your things that you need from a potential team member to help you achieve some of those goals. Um, and that is what's really important about having a developed business plan. And what I've done is I've put a little bit of a piece into that workbook, some great things to think about. If you don't have a business plan or you have, haven't uh, revisited in a while, we'll give you a few hints as to what you need to start thinking about. So for example, you know, really going back to that why, right? Why, why are you doing this? What is your purpose in this business? And in fact, that is really important when we talk about those things like your vision, your mission, and also your values, because ultimately what we want to do, and we'll, I'll show you where this fits in a little bit later, we want to go and find someone who understands what you're trying to create. They can identify with your why in your business. They can start to see the vision. They share some of the same values that you have in your business. So that's really important that you have that well articulated. Second part, of course, is those goals. What are you trying to accomplish? Right. And again, when we look at that, then we can start to think about, OK, who who are the people? What are the skills and experience that we would need in order to accomplish those things? And when we look at the challenges, the changes, we recognize the opportunities when we're understanding the layout and the landscape that we're um, you know, working with in our business, we can really start to get clear on what are the pieces that I have, especially because most of us here are solopreneurs, right? What are the things that we really are going to need in order to make this business plan really become a reality? And then we can talk about how can I recruit or hire for that? So this really is the starting point. What's your business plan? And really having a deep understanding and some analysis around how are we going to make this thing come to life? From the business plan, then we can stop, start to think about our recruitment plan, right? So we've identified the big picture. We've got the vision. We know some of the things that we're working towards and our goals. We understand where we may need to look to add some talent. In our recruitment plan, we want to start to think about, you know, who is it that we need? Why do we need them? Again, we probably already identified where that need is coming from. 
we're going to start thinking about what are they going to do and when do we need them? Because that's really important when we start to think about adding people to the business. We're, you know, in the second half of 2022. So is this recruitment, does it need to happen in the fall because we wanna have them in place for January because that's really when that thing is meant to happen or that goal needs to start to kick in in our business plan, okay? All right, so we wanna have a clear vision for our recruitment strategy. So after we've analyzed our business plan and we've thought about who we need, when we need them, you know, what we're going to get them to do and, and why we really need to bring them into our business. Okay. And there's questions inside of that workbook to help you really think about some of those pieces in more detail, because that's going to require a little bit of thought uh, from each of you. We want to get clear on what are all the activities in our business today? What is going on? And I, I made Kelly do some of this work, right? So she's probably laughing, but what are all of the different things that you are doing? And it's going to take a moment that this is, you know, you're not going to sit down all in one afternoon and list all the activities. You're probably going to have to go through about, you know, a week and think about all of the things, right? And again, also thinking about all of the things in the future. Right. So if I have a big client deliverable coming up or I have a big contract I've just signed, what are all the things that are going to be involved in those activities? Not just what I do now, but what I'm going to be doing in the future or what I would like to add. Right. Are there some revenue generating activities that either I could be doing or someone else could be doing? So there really is some deep thought required here in order to clarify what our vision is for the role. We can then start to group together some of the similar activities. So for example, I have a podcast. And um, when I was thinking about how do I outsource some of the support for this podcast, I was thinking about, okay, so clearly the things that I need to do is I need to record with the guests, right? That's my job. Um, and I then need to upload that recording into the software that we use because those recordings, you know, just like we do with Zoom, they live on my hard drive. So those are things that I have to do. But what are the activities that I could get someone else to do? So could I get someone to book the com book those um, appointments? And could I get them to send out reminder emails? And could I get them uh, to gather some headshots and some bios? Well, those are similar administrative activities and I could group those together. And it made sense for one person to take over some of those types of activities. So another example might be if you do a lot of your own social media but you're really producing a lot of the different graphics, a lot of the different slideshows, a lot of that kind of thing. Those are very similar activities. So does it make sense that potentially you would outsource that? You would find a graphic design person that could help you with those similar activities that you could group together. Perhaps they could work for you on contract. Perhaps if you have enough of that going on, they could be someone who could become a part-time or an hourly employee, right? So you can think about grouping activities together in your business so they make sense. And that's going to be important when we start to talk about who are we looking for in the skill sets that they have that might match those groups of activities. Of course, we want to be thinking about the necessary skills and experience, right? What kinds of backgrounds are these people going to need to have in order uh, for us uh, to, you know, make those activities, make those groupings make sense? right? And they can be multi-skilled. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, one thing and, and, and can only find one person that does that. And so now I have to have, you know, five different people in my business. No, that's not true. But we also, I find with um, some solopreneurs that we list off all the activities, we group them together. And then we start to think, well, they could do this, 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 and this. And those things are not connected in any way. So for example, could do some of the admin work like I talked about with my podcast and they could be a graphic designer and they could be uh, something else. Those skill sets don't necessarily go together. Might be harder 
to find someone who does three, three very diverse things opposed to two things that are closely connected. So we really wanna think about the necessary skills, the necessary education, the necessary experience that we would look for. I also think it's important in this moment to think about your own zone of genius. So what are the things that you like to do and actually enjoy doing? And I make that very clear because certainly we all have things we enjoy doing, but we're not very good at. So for example, I really like painting, but the truth is I am, I am terrible. I am never going to sell a painting in an art gallery, right? So that's not my zone of genius. On the other hand, I have things that I am really good at. I'm really good at writing process documentation, but I absolutely hate it, right? So that's not my zone of genius either. So what we really want to find for each and every one of you are what are the things that you do really well, but you also really love to do. Um, and thinking about as you list off all the activities in your business, keeping the things that you love to do the most and are the most skilled at first, um, and then finding the right talent to bring to your business for the other things that are not inside your zone of genius. Now, certainly, as entrepreneurs, that does not mean that we are going to be able to give away all the things that we don't like doing, all the things that take a lot of time in our, in our days. Um, but the more of those that we can find and we can give to someone else who is not only highly skilled at them, but actually really likes to do them, we free ourselves up to do more value added activities and ultimately to do more revenue generating activities for the most part, right? We also want to think about um, when it comes to having a really clear vision around our recruitment strategy, what is urgent versus what's important, right? So it may be urgent that I hire a virtual assistant because my inbox is overflowing, my Google Drive is, you know, absolutely running wild, um, and my desk is a mess, and I need to get someone really urgently to deal with some admin pieces. But I also want to think about, again, what is important? And when I say important, I'm thinking about my business plan. What are the important things that are going to help me generate revenue in my business? They're going to help me accomplish those goals and ultimately realize that vision for my business. And so I have some decisions to make here. And this is where we start to step into our CEO role, urgent versus important. Okay. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get really tactically into the recruitment in a moment. And as I mentioned, what generates revenue? Again, from the perspective of the things that you do in your zone of genius, but also when you think about hiring an expert, right? So I'll use the graphic designer example again. So if I hire someone who is highly skilled at graphic design, Likely for me anyways, it's going to take them probably half or even a third of the time that I would use working on a graphic in Canva, right? They're going to be super fast. They're going to be super effective. They're going to know right away the vision. They're going to be dialed in right away to what your brand looks like and feels like and all of those things. So they're going to take far less time than you would. They're also potentially going to produce something that is far more eye-catching, that is far more on brand, that is actually something you would repeat and reuse. And so ultimately, do they generate more revenue because what they create attracts more clients and can be leveraged over and over? So when we get clear about some of these things, when we pause, do some thoughtful analysis here then we can get a clear vision of what our recruitment needs to look like. Okay, I wanna pause there for a moment, Kelly. Are there any questions? Oh, super interesting conversation actually happening in the chat uh, about a few of the things that kind of uh, get, in, get in our way. One, being a control freak. Two, yeah. two, actually as a solopreneur, you're already doing all of the things. So maybe you have a bit of an expectation problem as yeah. far as 
I know how to do all these things. How come I can't find somebody who can also do like at least a lot of these things? Yeah. Um, I'm summarizing a lot here, but another thing that Catherine said was she brings on um, subcontractors, but that's, that's not necessarily the right kind of person because they have their own businesses as well. So would it be better to hire somebody who actually works for her business rather than somebody who kind of essentially has competing interests with you uh, in the, in the bigger vision of things. Yeah. Um, and then what was the other thing here? Oh yeah. The clone of me conversation. <laughs> clone of me. And I think actually, I think that's a beautiful conversation. So let me just say this clearly, because I've had more than once I have had entrepreneurs come to me and say, well, why don't they care about my business the way I do? Like, why can't I just go find someone who can do all the things that I do and has the passion that I have? So first and foremost, nobody's going to care about your business as much as you do, because it's not their business. So that I think is um, a bit of a, a bit of a myth that we actually have to come to terms with. The Mm. second thing is, the second thing is, no, when, when we're looking to create a role, a job in our business, we need to be sure that we group together these activities very carefully. And because if we're looking for a unicorn, we're not likely to find it. And just because you're a unicorn, you went and started your own business. Well, likely those other unicorns are running their own businesses. <laughs> so, right? It, it, beyond that, we'll, and we'll talk about this when we get tactical towards the end of the conversation. When we're going to market, when we're actually advertising this job, when we're doing the search part of this process, um, just like in our own businesses where we have to be clear with our marketing, our, our recruitment execution has to be clear in the same way, right? So Kelly would tell you um, that you can't be all things to all people. And this is the opposite of that. You can't look for all things in one person, right? Mm. So we do need to have some clarity in the role um, and making sure that we are looking at those similar activities and similar skill sets um, mm-hmm. so that we can find the right person. Yeah. And I've noticed one of those, those things that for me, I feel like is something that I want more of, but is not necessarily what I communicated or what the person in the role thinks their job is, is to be more, um, uh, what's the word, there's kind of like a, a person who's really great at like doing the tasks that you line out for them, but then there's, there's somebody who can actually anticipate more and like create and think for you yeah. versus just doing for you. Right. And right. where's the blend of that? Yeah. Initiative. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Or proactivity. Right. And, yeah. and the truth is, is that that if you find the right person, that proactivity that will come, that's something that you can coach as they become more confident and competent in their role. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, now, certainly something that you would want to think about articulating in the job description and all the way through the process. There's ways that you can do that, right? There's questions that you can ask people to uncover how proactive they can be. Um, but certainly when we're starting someone out in the business, they are being very reactive, right? So that might be something that you want to build into the performance and the coaching that you're going to do with an, a new team member, whether it's a contractor, I would say maybe less as a contractor. Contractors really are all about deliverables, all about execution. Whereas an employee, you would want to get to the point where they are more proactive. They are more engaged in that vision so that they can get ahead of it, right? They're really being innovative and and leading in those ways. But that's a great point, Kelly. Okay, anything else in the chat? No, I think I think everyone's really loving this. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I moving, anyways. <laughs> moving forward. This is the big question. What role do you need to move your business forward? Because let's be honest, if we all had nothing but money, we probably have five people doing five different things, right? But we really need to focus on what is the role that we need to move our business forward, really to execute on that business plan, what's going to get us further faster, right? So that ultimately, when we're thinking about our recruitment strategy, that's really the big question. 
Now we can start to think about the who, who do we need, right? We've done the analysis of the business plan. We've got a list of all the to-dos. We've grouped those to-dos together. So now we can start to think about who might be able to do those groupings of things, that most important role we need to hire for. And yes, of course, we are looking for skills, experience, knowledge, right? The ability to deliver. It's also important that we are thinking about the who from the perspective of what they value, the behaviors they have, and their purpose. Again, that's why we started with what was our business plan? What was our why? Because we want to find somebody who aligns with that. We want to find someone that shares some of the same values that we do and that we bring to our business. We want to find people that have the behaviors. So behaviors are how we demonstrate our values in the way we work, the way we show up as people. So we want people that are going to show up in a way that represents the values. And we want them to be able to share some of the same purpose that we have and that, of course, is the purpose that we bring to our business every day. So we've got some of the you know, hard skills is perhaps what we would call it. Um, and those are the things that are going to be you know, really demonstrated on a resume. But also some of these softer, more cultural perspectives that it's actually this is where we can really mess up with our recruitment. We can, I, I see this all the time, and I'm working with a client right now who just had to terminate someone who looked like they had all the skills, experience, and knowledge. And the truth is they didn't share some big, important values with the organization, and ultimately their behavior just didn't align. And it was tragic because they'd spent a lot of time and money and energy recruiting this person, and they just didn't work out. So bringing these two pieces together is absolutely key uh, to making sure that we're, we're going to find the right talent. When we've identified those pieces, we can start to get tactical. So this next step is about creating a job description and ultimately a job posting. And I delineate the two things. Now, this is not exactly critical, but a job description is likely going to be longer and more detailed. Whereas a job posting is marketing your job. So it's going to be shorter, punchier, more energetic. Okay, so one is an internal document that you're not necessarily going to share. I mean, you know, you, you create a posting on a place like Indeed or Glassdoor or even LinkedIn. It's pretty short, right? It's about marketing the, the role, advertising the role. And that's really when we talk about our business, we want to have a brief discussion about our brand and culture, because that's really important that we start to bring that into the discussion right from the start. Again, the values and the vision need to live in a job posting as well. Of course, we want to have a description of the main accountabilities. In the job posting, the marketing aspect, we're going to highlight the main ones. In the job description, which is the internal document, we can be a lot more detailed. Right. So there can be more um, and uh, more layered and more tactical pieces in there if we need them to be. We're going to outline the skills and experience that we want. And that's generally the same between both documents. So we would talk about the things that we're looking for. The, do they have a certain level of education? Do they have certain certifications? Right? Do they have a certain number of years doing those things? That's what we're looking for there. And I think it's also important that we articulate what does success look like in this role? Because if we can accurately describe that, what we're going to do is attract the right kind of person to respond. Again, in the same way that we market our business and we market our offerings, now we're marketing our business, but we're doing it in a slightly different way. Um, and so we really want to talk about what it's like to work here, what this role will deliver and, and how that will impact and be successful inside of the organization. Okay, and I've got a, a very basic job posting outline for you in the workbook. 
uh, so that you can think about some of these things and start creating. And it doesn't need to be long, right? When we think about the job posting, the advertisement for the job, we want to keep it pretty tight. I mean, people, as we know, have pretty short attention spans. They're not going to read through pages and pages of a job posting. And this is, I have a client that we've just, uh, we're reworking their recruitment strategy as, uh, you know, sort of as we speak. And in fact, that's what they had. They had a job posting that was exceptionally long and exceptionally detailed. Um, and the truth was, people were actually reading about a third of it and they were losing interest. Now, when I spoke with the business owner, she said, well, you know, I really thought that it was, um, you know, a bit of a gatekeeper. If they got all the way to the bottom um, and read it all the way through with that one last instruction on it, that, that they were the right candidate. And I said, you know, I, I actually think we're making this harder than it is, needs to be, right? Like we have made this job posting so complex and so detailed um, that we're actually, I think we're driving away uh, some top candidates. So there is a sweet spot. Usually it is about a page, maybe a page and a half. Um, if you're going too much longer than that, I, I think you might be going into too much detail. So check out um, in the workbook, uh, the, the, uh, the guide uh, that I've got in there for you. It's got like four main sections. Um, and then you could sprinkle in some additional detail from there, but it would give you a really great head start on creating a really high quality job posting uh, that's going to attract the right person. Any questions there, Kelly, in the um, chat? Um, just, I, I know that you're like sharing lots of details and lots of yes. things. Um, you're also going to address the mindset piece at some point, yes? Yes, at the end. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. I, I'm giving you, I'm giving you lots of detail here today because I want you all to feel like you can successfully organize a, a, a recruitment plan and move forward with this. So I am going into some detail. We're getting pretty tactical right now, but yes, hundred percent. I'm going to talk about, you know, your mindset as a leader at the end, because that's going to be really important to make sure this whole thing is successful. Okay, so we've got a great, we've got great clarity about why we need someone in our business and who that person might look like. Now we're going to talk about the where and the how. So this is your attraction strategy. This is actually marketing the job, how you're going to go and find that right team member. And this doesn't have to be, again, super complex, but there's some things to consider. So are you going to post it online? So there's job boards that you can use um, that are, you know, sort of free of charge. You can leverage LinkedIn. It's a great place to post for people. Indeed, Workopolis, Monster, Facebook. Um, you know, you can certainly leverage your own social media pieces in order to advertise that you are looking for something. You know, potentially, if this is someone that you think is a contractor, there's some great gig sites that you might wanna consider um, leveraging, like Fiverr. Um, if it's something that, you know, is uh, gonna be, you know, sort of only a few hours a week or a few hours a month. You can also really leverage your own network, right? So word of mouth getting referrals from other business partners, or maybe even some peers, some business besties. You want to spread the word. Our networks are really powerful. And often we can find really great talented people um, if we just talk about what we're looking for and if we can be articulate, right? So that's why it's important that we work through some of that detail first so we actually know what we're talking about. Some other places to look could be students. And I know Kelly and I have both worked through work experience programs that have found us really great people. Certainly there's agencies that you can contact. So I have, um, I have some business partners that actually, um, that's what they do. They have virtual assistant agencies. And so they uh, match up um, uh, entrepreneurs with virtual assistants from all over the world. And they have their own really robust process inside of their organizations uh, to make sure that they match with the right people. Having said that, 
even if you're going to use an agency or a recruiter, doing your own homework first, again, being clear on why do you need this this particular role and who do you need in that role? How is that going to help you accomplish your business plan? That's work you have to do as the founder of your business, as the CEO first, in order to make sure that you're approaching the agency, you're approaching the recruiter in the right way, and you are clear about what you're looking for because they can't help you. They can't be effective if you don't know what you need. And that's what's really important. That that's a big part of our own mindset at first. Awesome. So once we've done that, once we've got our uh, recruitment plan set up, we know where we want to find our person. We've got our job description ready to go. We've got some resumes coming in. Now we can talk about process. So there's four parts to a recruitment process. There's the screening, there's the interviewing, with which people find very intimidating. We have to make sure we finish up with some reference checks. And then, of course, we want to make an offer if we find the right person. Okay. So first of all, screening resumes. We are absolutely screening and reviewing for skills and experience match. So we have our job description, which we've been very clear in, and we've used that to post. Now we're matching that up with the resumes that we've got. So we can go through line for line. Does this, pe does this resume, does this person have what I've asked for? And actually you can make it really easy. You can use check marks and X's and stars, okay? So as you go down a resume and you see that, yes, they have done that, I asked for that. That's a check mark. No, they haven't done that. That's an X or they've done something that's not quite the same, but it's pretty close, or maybe there's a transferable skill there. They, you know, they've, they've been in, um, you know, a different type of role, but it's pretty close. You could use a star. And in that way, it actually makes it very easy for you to assess, do they have the skills and experience that match? And it also, for example, if you get 20 resumes, 25, I mean, you know, sometimes we can get quite a few makes it very easy for us to see who has the most check marks. Well, that's probably someone that I want to I want to look into further or potentially I want to talk to. We also need to assess some values alignment. So be be have a keen eye when you're reviewing resumes and the cover letters that often come with them. Um, that you want to look and see what values pop out in what they're talking about you know, what they're saying in their resume, um, what they're talking about in their cover letter as they address why they think they're right for your job. You could also potentially add to this process. I have a client that asks their candidates to do a somewhere between two and four minute video. And Kelly, I think you've done that in the past where if you've asked candidates, you know, to answer a couple questions uh, on a Loom video or a video they've recorded on their phone. So you could, potentially do something like that to assess some values. I think yeah. that worked pretty well for you, didn't it, Kelly? Part of it was figure out how to make a video. If you can't figure out how to make a video and send it to me, you're not going right? to fit this job very well either, right? Um, Catherine just asked, would you recommend including specific questions to help draw out the values? Yeah, so... Um, uh, asking, we're going to, we're going to talk about how you can ask questions in the interview process that will draw out those values, but certainly in a video, you could do that. I mean, you can ask, you know, why did you apply for this job? What attracted to you, it, it, it to you in the first place? What's important um, in the, you know, what makes you, what gets you up in the morning? What gives you joy in your work? You could ask some things like that, particularly in a video that might be really valuable in helping you assess some of that values alignment. You could ask them to put it in a cover letter, right? In your cover letter, please include. We get to ask, you know, in our job applications for things like that. Um, so, you know, think about what those might be. Now, you don't want to ask 10 questions, probably one or two would be something that would be appropriate, maybe three or four if you're getting them to do a video. So kind of depends on how you want to approach that, but you can think that through, like what's going to work for you, what's going to make sense for your business, and what also makes sense from the perspective of the role that you're hiring for. 
Right. So uh, I just want to add something because when you and I were talking before, so I did, I did hire a student last year on a four month um, work experience and the process for hiring did include a video because one of the things that I was really concerned about was personality fit and that I believe like I I feel like I'm a pretty uh, strong judge of character from having a conversation with people and just getting a sense of their personality and what what that would be like so I I did ask them I what I was looking for in the video was the something about like why they wanted to work for my company. Yeah. And, and that is kind of goes back to your previous comment about, okay, sure. Nobody necessarily is going to like feel as passionate about what you do as you do, but how can you find somebody that like, cause when you're t- that, there's nothing better, truly like one of the most exciting parts, regardless of they had a lot of challenges working with a student that I wasn't expecting, but it was a great learning experience. But there's nothing better than feeling like there's somebody here to do this thing with you, this thing that you're trying to do that is like helping you move forward a mission that really matters and and having them be invested in it. Yeah, nothing better. It it is. And, And ultimately, isn't that what we all want? We all want someone who is invested in the work that they do and in helping you grow the business. I mean, that's and and ultimately. I, you know, I have some, um, I have some HR partners and and some senior leaders that kind of laugh, but I do believe that people want to show up to work and do their best work every day. I really do. And when we give them the opportunity to do that, I happen to believe that most people will show you what they got. Now, sometimes they're going to show you and you're going to say, yeah, that's not good enough. I'm afraid you can't work here anymore. That's another conversation. Um, but, but ultimately, I think that's what we're all looking for. And so there's an opportunity here to design a process that's going to help you find that to the best of your ability, right? So great comment, Kelly. I, the other important thing here that I want to mention is declining the non-matches. I think that this is really important, and I'll tell you why. People deserve to know if you're not interested and it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be drawn out, but at every step of the recruitment process, if someone doesn't make the cut, they deserve to know that. And I will tell you that from small to enormous companies, um, don't do this. Um, You know, I hear from people all the time that I applied for 50 jobs and I never got a single response. That to me is disrespectful. They've gone to the trouble and the time of putting together a resume and a cover letter and submitting it to you, especially if you ask them to go to the time and trouble of creating some kind of video or, you know, again, using the, using the graphic designer, you know, uh, conversation, maybe you've asked them to submit some work or portfolio of some kind. They absolutely deserve some kind of a response that says, We've decided to go in a different uh, direction. We really appreciate you applying. Thanks again for your time, you know, with, you know, respectfully or sincerely, right? Um, That is absolutely critical um, because people deserve to be dealt with, you know, with dignity. And ultimately, I think that reflects on our business brand. Again, we are advertising our organization here. We're just doing it in a different way. And so even though they're not the right fit to work in your business, they could potentially be a client. So we want to make sure that we're being super respectful when it comes to that. So now we have collected some resumes. We've done some initial screening. The tricky part about resumes and even cover letters, even videos to some degree, is that they're a little two-dimensional, right? Um, Resumes are terribly black and white. I will also tell you that in excess of 70% of people over-exaggerate or outright lie on a resume. So once we've gone through the process and we've identified the top, I would say two, three, maybe four resumes, these people look like they've got the skills, the experience, you know, maybe they've done a video for us. We're feeling the energy. We feel like they're a fit. Kelly's word is a great word. Then there's an opportunity to hop on the phone with them for a quick 30 minute telephone interview. And a lot of people skip this step in the process. But I feel like it's going, it's actually really critical because ultimately it's going to save you a lot of time. You're going to know pretty quickly 
through this casual conversation if you want to speak with them further or not, right? So you're going to talk a little bit about the details of the role, maybe go over that job description, could ask again, you know, what really motivated you uh, to apply for the job, see if they come up with a different response, or maybe it's the same, right? You're going to confirm their education and their experience, and you're going to, again, be listening for attitude and fit. And that includes some of the values, some of the way they behaved, how they talk about previous employment opportunities or previous, you know, as if they're a contractor, previous work or projects that they've done. And you're really going to be listening ultimately. Is this someone you want to talk to more? Do you want to find out more about them? Um, and it's also important at this stage that you're providing a little bit of a timeline. Um, so giving an opportunity for them to understand that, yes, you're doing, you know, telephone interviews this week with three or four people. You'll know by Friday afternoon if you're going to move forward with them to a formal in, you know, in-person or Zoom interview at that point. So you give them a little bit of information. Also gives them an opportunity to ask you a few questions. Make sure that you leave time in each uh, of these interviews uh, for them to ask you questions. When we're in a recruitment, um, you know, sort of strategy like this, it's as much about them asking us questions as it is about, you know, a fit for them as it is fit for us, right? And, um, uh, you know, we're in a place right now where our labor market is pretty tight and people are making really important choices about where they work based on, do I fit with this organization? Do I want to work for someone like Kelly? Do I want to work with someone like Lindsay? Is this actually the job that I read about in this job ad that they put out? Does this make sense? Do I feel like it's a fit for my skill set? So our candidates are evaluating us too. We need to leave room for questions uh, so that they can be sure that they want to move forward. That, that is sort of make such, sense? A, such a good point and an important shift from if you have ever applied for jobs, how you you think about like what an interview process is when you're applying for a job. I, I just thought of it as like, well, I obviously want this job and like here I am showing up trying to get the job versus like, like, and so almost you forget to think about whether the person is interviewing you too, which they should be. And I even had that happen with one of the students <laughs> was like, do you have an onboarding process? And I was like, I will by the time I hire you. <laughs> He's yeah. like, but, but fair enough. Cause he was like, I worked with the startup before and they had no idea really how to like show me what was going on or talk to me about anything. And I was like, yep, good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also you sound high maintenance. So I can't <laughs> you right now. Yeah. But I think, you know, it gives them an opportunity to talk to you about, you know, sort of what's the day in the, like, what are you anticipating here? What do you think this looks like? And you can say to them, Hey, you know what, this is a net new role. I'm, I'm, we're, I'm building the plane as I'm flying it here. And I'm looking for someone who is down with that. Right. That's a big oh. fit piece, right? Kelly? hundred percent. Entrepreneurship is different. Uh, like you are different. not a corporation at this point. You mm -hmm. don't have like all these people and multiple oh. leaders and you are the owner hiring yeah. a person to like come into this amazing thing that you're creating that you think is awesome. So you need them to like be on board with that and see, yeah. see a place for themselves in how they can participate in shaping that. And like, that is, that's the thing that keeps coming up in the chat, like the control, like, yeah. how do I, how do I let somebody else in to be part of this and let them bring their expertise and their ideas and their yeah. time? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, we as uh, entrepreneurs, we really have to start, uh, you know, at this phase, we have to start tr transitioning our mindset into the CEO space, right? We've been the chief cook and bottle washer and Kelly and I have both been there, right? We have both been there. But in all reality, we also have to recognize from a strategic perspective that our organizations likely can't grow the way we want them to unless we get help. Right now, sometimes it's more help, sometimes that's less help. But realistically, we need help. We know that, 
right? Um, and so what, what's the CEO move? And we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I love that it's filtering in throughout uh, this conversation. I also love all the parallels you keep drawing to brand and marketing, because obviously that's my area of expertise, but it's so true. Like even with what you said there, we can't yeah grow unless we get help and we can't grow or we can't help people unless we market ourselves and advertise and do these things. Like we have to take the action at some point in order to actually fulfill our own goals and our own purpose. Yeah, exactly. And, and with, so with my larger, more institutional clients, that's what we start to talk about is recruitment brand. Uh, because it is important that, that our entire business brand is cohesive. And when we're recruiting, we're again, we're marketing the business, we're just doing it in a slightly different way. And when we talk about recruitment branding, it is things like bringing out those values, it is things like bringing out that fit and that culture, right? So, so um, yes, for this purpose, try to keep it a little bit more streamlined. But absolutely, as we grow, we need to think about what is that, right? Um, so next step, we've, we've had the, the telephone interview, which is more casual, it's more approachable, more of a conversation. Now there's a few questions. I've got a list of, of great questions in the workbook for you. There's some questions there that you will see are more casual and may lend themselves uh, to that telephone pre-screen. Again, keeping it to about 30 minutes, keeping it relatively light, uh, making sure that there is space for questions uh, it, from the candidates. Then we would select only the top people. So for many of us, that would be one to two, maximum three. You only have one job, you don't need to interview 10 people for it, right? So I would tell you only your very top candidates would get to a more formal interview. Now, we're back to in-person, so you could do this face-to-face -face if that was appropriate. Certainly, Zoom works very well uh, for these conversations, too. Um, these are going to be longer in length. I would tell you that this is probably more like 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and this involves you asking more of the questions, them providing more of the responses. It's going to be a little bit less casual. And what we want to do here is we not only want to ask more in-depth skill and experience questions, but we want to get into those situational or behavioral questions. So some of you are likely familiar with these if you worked in a corporate background and you did any hiring or you've been on job, you know, a job search of your own. So often these questions start with tell me about a time when or give me an example of. And the reason we want to ask these types of questions is because what people have done in the past, they're likely to repeat in the future. So for example, one of the most common questions, tell me about a time when you've experienced conflict in the workplace. You know, what, what was your experience and what did you do? So what we want them to tell us is the story. We want to know about the time and we want them to relay to us what they did, specifically them, how they went and moved through that and what the resolution was, okay? So these questions are not challenging to ask. Um, we're just looking for them to tell us the story about it. But what's really important here is we get the opportunity to probe. Oh, tell me more about that piece or what did you do then? Or how did that work out? Or where did you go from there? We get to ask multiple questions on the same story. And what we get to do is really deeply understand what they value, how they behave, how they react. This is where some of the proactive stuff can come in, Kelly. And ultimately, we get an even better assessment of how they'll fit with us because we get to understand how they operate. Right. So that's why we want to make sure that we have some of these great situational questions in our interview uh, when we're doing this more formally. And again, there's some great ones that I've listed for you um, in the workbook. You don't have to ask a whole bunch of these questions, um, but certainly thinking about we, you know, we sort of have already outlined what our values we're looking for and the behaviors. Um, those are what we want to formulate into questions. So for example, Kelly talked about proactive. She wants to find someone for her business that's very proactive. So you could ask a question. 
Tell me about a time when you proactively solved a problem or did a thing, right? You can make that specific to your business, but then we can understand, are they actually really proactive in the way that we would define it? So this is where we can really start to understand, not only are they a fit like someone we like, but are they a fit for the behaviors we want to grow in our business? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? I, I love that, like you think about those questions and again, it's just that shift from being on the other side of it, but anytime you're asking a question, knowing why you're asking the question is really important to be able to go. The, the purpose of this is that I'm looking for an answer that leads, that suggests this or that rather than like, oh, like, cause you can Google top 10 interview questions or whatever and ask them, but if you don't really understand like why you've ask them to come up with some scenario and you're just like having this flashback of being a university student or second (laughs) year like oh my god this is the worst interview ever I don't even know what was all those questions about no and so I I love that you connected those dots Kelly because that's really important this is why we've done all of the planning work up front because when we use the interview both pieces of it right? So you want to make sure that your telephone interview and your former inter- formal interview kind of layer on top of each other, right? We want to make sure that we are getting the information that relate all the way back to the job description, all the way back to the business plan, right? Mm-hmm. So when we think about the job description and we want someone who's proactive, we want someone who can problem solve, We right? So We've built this all the way in, and now we get to ask the person, the person, how do they do that? And then we get to evaluate, does that match up with what we think we're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. So that's beautiful. Catherine had, um, had made a comment earlier about hesitating to advertise because she's a professional organizer and decluttering and organizing is fairly trendy and all these people you know, think they know how to do it, or maybe they want to, because now, you know, Marie Kondo and it's all on Netflix and everything. So like everywhere on Pinterest, how do you make sure that you can find suitable candidates in in the case where you're actually worried about being bombarded with applicants? You know, I, I think that that's a great question. And so when you're approaching your recruitment and attraction strategy, Uh, I think that that's something you want to very seriously consider. So here would be some of my thoughts. And this is just top of my head, Catherine. Are there particular Facebook groups where the people you're looking for would hang out? Um, Are there, you know, actually trade organizations, professional organizations? You know, is there a designation? And maybe they have a job board. Like some of those kinds of things where you could really get that Uh, posting in front of the right people. And so it might be something interesting to dig into um, and brainstorm around where those places might be. But you're right. Maybe that's not something that you want to put out on Indeed because you're going to get a thousand people who just love to organize their closet, right? Um, So I think that that's a, a great question to consider. And for everyone else, right? Like where, who are you looking for and where is the best place to find them? Um, And if you can really hone in on the places that they hang out, again, just like we do with our marketing, um, then we can then we can target our job posting uh, to the right people. Another interesting skill set are I don't know whether it's skill set, but behavior or or just trait that's uh, important to consider and list for me anyways, was entrepreneurial versus intrapreneurial Mm -hmm. as some people call it like the ability to uh work in an entrepreneurial environment that is you know i literally throw my business plan out in the garbage like every three months like there might be a new thing to launch every 30 days we're gonna have lots of seasons of like hustle versus like it's not gonna be your your corporate job where you come and you work eight to five and it's going to be the same all the time. But at the same time, I don't want someone who's maybe so entrepreneurial that their end goal is to have their own business. Because if I want to invest in bringing somebody on board and 
uh, training them and growing and doing these things together, like I hope that they want to stay at the end of the day too. So how to have that conversation up front as well. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think those are beautiful things to think through. And if you spend the time and the energy up front to really think about some of those nuanced pieces, your execution will be so much more effective on the back end. You'll be so much more clear about who you're looking for. And then when you get into this interview process, you will be able to ask the right questions, get into the right situational responses that will help you identify the right person. So I think that's brilliant that you make that very fine distinction, intra versus um, what entrepreneurial versus intrapreneurial. I love that. And actually, this is kind of aligning with what Catherine is saying in the chat. And it's almost like a question of whether what's more important, the the mindset or the skill set, like which one can you train? And if you more so need a person who's actually going to stick with you versus grow their own business, what do they need to have? Like, what are you actually willing to teach them about how to actually do the job? Right. Yeah. And I would tell you, so I, I would say yes and yes. So first and foremost, you know, being aware of what's the baseline of skills and experience, right? Like if you're hiring an accountant and they need to be an accountant, then they have to have an accounting designation. That is the baseline. But in all reality, um, you know, um, do they have to have an actual designation or do they just need to have some experience and you can upskill them, you can train them, you can help them grow, right? And in that growth, they'll help you grow your business. So I do think it's important that you identify what is the baseline? Like, what are the skills and experience you just have to have, right? You're not hiring, a, you know, a, a student that is right out of school, or maybe you are, and you're willing to spend the time in the growth, but knowing that they may not stay with you, right? But, it, you know, making sure you identify that. And then yes, the actual the fit, as you have called it, Kelly, is is the most important part. You can't you can't train that. You can't build that. It's they either have those things that you need for them to work effectively in your business, or they don't. Right? They either have some of the values. They share those with you and your organization. They they have some of those developed behaviors, or or they don't. And so those things are really important. And then you can decide, can you upskill this person appropriately? Or are you at a stage in your business where you can't, right? So I'm working with a client right now and they have said, um, we are looking for new bookkeepers and these people have to have between three and five years worth of experience. We do not have capacity for anyone who has anything less. Fair enough, right? So I think every business owner, every CEO especially if this is going to be one of your very first hires, you have to think about that very carefully. Again, before you even post the job, make sure that you've got some of these things really solid in your mind, right? Okay, great discussion. This is awesome. I love this stuff. So good. All right. At the end of the day, we got to remember, decline with dignity. So if we have, and this is a rule of thumb, won't hold you to it. If you have spoken with them um, in person, likely it's a phone call. If you really don't have the time for that, it has to be at least a well-crafted email. Thank you so much for all your time and energy. We really appreciated meeting with you last week. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got some news that I know you don't want to hear, and that is we won't be moving forward with you as a candidate, um, but we would really love to stay connected with you. Right. We, you know, we're following each other now on Instagram. It's been a pleasure meeting with you and we wish you the best of luck. Doesn't have to be a big deal, but you have to decline people with dignity. That's what they deserve. You have to keep in communication regularly with your candidates. And if you don't, you will lose them. Right. So if you say that you're going to send them a message on Friday to tell them an update on what's happening in your process, make sure that you send them an email on Friday or give them a call or send them a text, whatever you've agreed on as your way of communication, that's going to be really important. And the other thing I want to mention here is you need to manage your own bias. And we as human beings, we are bias machines. We, we make a gajillion judgments a day. That's what our brains are built to do. 
but we are built to like and to connect with people who are just like us. So this is why Kelly and I are like business besties, because we both have lots of energy, we both have great ideas, and we both love to just get shit done, right? But that may not be what I need in my business. And I have to check my bias and make sure that I am not favoring one candidate over another just because they look or sound or behave like me. Because in fact, I may be missing out on the best thing that could happen to my business, which is someone who doesn't think like me, someone who is more detailed, someone who is more introspective, someone who does want to take something and marinate and think about it, as opposed to me, who is just super excited and wants to get it done right now and let's do it, right? In fact, I may need someone who isn't like me. So this is really important and sort of underpins this whole process is I really have to manage my own bias. And this, this fits right into your mindset as a CEO. I was going to say that that last piece of advice is to be remembered ongoing. (laughs) (laughs) After you hire somebody, you still have to remember, oh, they don't react the same way that I do in this situation. And that's fine. And why, why isn't this done instantly? Because they're taking a minute to think about it. Like you probably should have. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's what Kelly and I identify with your, your bias may be something slightly different. Um, But I think we really, if we're going to operate as a CEO, if we're going to be strategic in our business, it is one of the most important things that we need to do on a regular basis is check ourselves, right? Okay, so we have collected resumes. We've got candidates. We did some telephone interviews. We found a couple great people. We did some in-person interviews. We asked those beautiful behavioral questions. We think we found the right fit. We're ready to make an offer, okay? There are a few important things that need to go into your offer, um, which are being clear about the compensation. And you should have been articulate about that throughout this process. What are you willing to pay this person? And it's really important that you understand that that needs to go into I'm going to call an offer letter, but what you may want to do first is you may want to call them or email them and say, hey, we interviewed on Friday. It's Tuesday. I said I would get back to you. I'd like to make you a conditional offer. I'm willing to pay you $25 an hour. That's what we've talked about. Um, You know, let me reiterate some of my expectations about the role. You know, we've been we've been over the job description. Um, And I'd like you to start on the 15th of July. And the reason this becomes a conditional offer at this point, whether I've sent an email or maybe I've called them on the phone, because that's what I love to do, because it's exciting. I make it conditional until I get the reference checks done. This is an important little compliance piece. We want to get two to three references from, from this candidate, preferably employers like, um, supervisors, managers, people that they have reported to. That's who you want to talk to. You don't want to talk to their friend. You don't want to talk to their sister. You don't want to talk to their cousin twice removed. You want to talk to preferably the last manager they worked for. And you want to ask them about how they perform. What, what did, what did they do? Well, where did they, you know, where did they struggle? How can, and how can I support their growth in the new role? Right. And Uh, that's sort of the important, would they hire them again? Like ultimately that's the big question. Would they take them back? And if they say no, you may want to second guess if this is the right, you you know, you want to ask why, but you know, if they wouldn't hire them back, why would they not? But it is really important that the offer is conditional until you conduct those reference checks. And I always like to phone References, I like to talk to them because I think you get more out of the conversation. You get more of the nuance and inflection of their voice, right? Um, But if you have to, you can email and just ask them the three or four questions. You know, what did this person do well? Where, you know, where, where do they have opportunities for growth? How can I help them grow? And would they hire them back? It's that simple. Reference doesn't need to be complicated. 
Um, but it is important that you do your own due diligence because you never know what you're going to dig up in those conversations may save you from making a bad hiring decision. And I'll tell you, I have seen it. I have been in, you know, the last big organization that I worked for, I was leading a recruitment and I, you know, did the reference checks. And one of the people said, actually, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have them back. They didn't perform well for me. Um, and that led us to make a different decision in our hiring process. So nine times out of 10, you're going to get great references um, and you're going to hear things that are going to be really important to helping you help your new team member be successful. Okay. And then you want to put that in a more formal way once you've done that. Um, so if you've sent an email, you could uh, follow up with a letter that says, um, you know, now here's our formal offer, formal start date, and you might want to get them to sign on the bottom line um, and, uh, you know, make sure that you have all of that written down and that everybody is in agreement. So there's no question. Um, certainly, this would be the point where, an, um, you know, uh, you could, if you wanted to do an employment contract, if you were really someone that likes to cross the T's and dot the I's, you can do that. But for the most part, that's not necessary. Having that, you know, sort of offer letter signed and, and dated uh, usually is good enough uh, here in Alberta at, at any rate. I'm not sure what the rules are in the UK. If you're from a different country, you definitely want to double check some labor laws to make sure. All right. Very last step in this process, this recruitment process is onboarding. We want to make sure that we've gone to all this hard work that we found the right person. And Kelly, I think you said this earlier, you know, you had an experience where you had a candidate that said, yeah, I worked for a startup and they had no one. They never thought about what they were going to do with this person once they hired them. So this is real. This is actually really important uh, to make sure that now that you've found the right person, that you can get them up to speed and working productively in your business as fast as possible. And in the recruitment world, they, we call that speed to contribution. So ultimately, that's a measure. That's a KPI. If you're working in recruitment, speed to contribution is the time from the day you post the job to the day that, the, that your in new person is working independently in their job. And that's a measure um, that organize, big organizations use. Um, and onboarding is a huge part of getting that person up and running. So again, a little planning in the beginning goes a long way right? What do you need them to learn? When do you need them to learn it? Who do they need to learn it from? And generally, that's all from us, right? So we need to schedule for success here, making sure that we have time in our calendars, because I've absolutely worked with clients, that we've gone through the hiring process, got right to the end, and then they've realized, oh, no, I have two weeks vacation. Okay, well, I can't, I can't have someone start. Nobody's going to be available to show them anything. Right. So need to make sure that this is all scheduled and that you have time built in so that you can work directly with your new person. If there's someone else already in your business, maybe you have a VA or maybe you have some other contractor that you can get them time with those people as well. And that can be tricky. I mean, we have busy schedules and also building in time so that they can just process um, we've all been in that moment where the first few weeks, few months in a business feels pretty overwhelming. So don't over schedule your individual, but make sure that you've set things up, particularly from a scheduling perspective, so that you can all be successful. It's important when we're onboarding to over communicate. We want to make sure that this person feels connected. They feel connected to us. They feel connected to the vision. They feel connected to our values and that they belong working with us in our organization. So even if you feel like you've communicated enough, communicate more, share more, talk more. It is so easy with things like Zoom to just create a co-working space so that they can feel connected and they can just feel free to ask a question right? It's super easy to do that, but make sure that you are over communicating with this individual in the first few weeks, at least. You also want to make it personal, right? This individual, especially in our super small, our micro businesses, 
These people are absolutely important and they're going to make an impact right from day one. So we want to make it a real connected relationship, right? Now, we don't have to know everything and we don't have to share everything. Some of us aren't comfortable with that. Some of them won't be, but we do want to make it something that is really meaningful. So um, asking, what makes you feel valued? What makes you feel rewarded? What would be an important job for you? What would make you, what makes you feel great um, about the work you do? How, how can I celebrate you when I think you do something really well? Just asking some of those questions, engaging in some of those conversations will help you make it personal, make it feel connected. Okay. And I've got, again, in the workbook, bit of an onboarding plan, and I've broken it down sort of like the first week, you know, one week, one or two. And then I think I've got week three to five. And then, so I've broken it down with some comments under there about things you might want to consider building in. The way I like to articulate an onboarding plan is I go day by day. So day one through five, that's the first week. And I'm talking about hiring someone full-time. If you're hiring someone part-time or even as a contractor, that's going to look different. But really thinking for the first sort of 10 business days, however long it takes them to get to that, what do they need to know on day one? Um, are there um, logins, passwords, access to Google you know, drives? Do you need to set them up on an email? Can you do that in advance? You know, sort of thinking about day by day for the first few days, and then you can start to go week by week and make sure that you are programming in, again, scheduling for success, regular touch points and communication. So that might mean, you know, especially if you are the chief cook and bottle washer and you're hiring your very first team member, that may mean that you are touching base with your new person several times a day. Again, creating a co-working space where you can be together and they can ask you questions when they need to. Do you need a Slack channel? All of those kinds of things. But when you create that, those touch points for them, um, at least on a, on a sort of daily basis, then they know uh, that they've always got someone to go to if they have a question. And I think you always, as well, as a leader, now we're going to transition into some mindset pieces again, thinking about how you are setting up that feedback loop for them, how you are right from the very beginning, um, leading them, giving them feedback and, and, and setting them up for success. Okay. Awesome. So I just segued myself. <laughs> Your leadership is critical in all of this. And again, it's been beautiful that we've woven this throughout the whole conversation, but you are really, especially if you are hiring your very first person, whether they're a contractor or an employee, you are really stepping in now to the leadership role in your business. You are really becoming a CEO and it is absolutely critical um, that you are doing some important things here. You need to set clear expectations. And I would say not only expectations of your new team member, but expectations for yourself. So you need to start thinking about who do I want to be and how do I want to lead, right? What is my leadership brand? And how am I going to behave in terms of how I'm interacting uh, with my new person? You want to make sure that you are communicating regularly. So some of that is as simple as scheduling that into calendars. So even beyond the onboarding period, I recommend um, to all my leaders, whether they're in sort of medium sized organizations, all the way down to the solopreneurs I work with, you need to meet with your person once a week. And that can't just be about the to-do list, right? What are the deliverables? Are we getting them done? No. We need to actually connect with the human being, right? The work is one part of it, 100%. But we need to make sure that we are connecting and communicating with people, right? We, um, we lead people, we manage tasks. And I think that's an important distinction. We also, as a leader, have to get great at delivering feedback. And this is something that is really hard sometimes is to be clear and concise in that feedback when we know it's likely going to hurt someone's feelings. 
And I'll tell you, nobody really enjoys doing this. I mean, maybe there's a few weirdos that do. Um, but as a leader and as a CEO, we have to create the mindset for ourselves that being clear in our feedback is actually helping the individual grow and ultimately helping our business grow. I would tell you the opposite is true. To be a truly great leader, we need to be able to receive feedback and not have a meltdown, right? And I think probably many of you have worked for that kind of leader. I have. That when I gave that individual feedback, they couldn't handle it. Really need to think about how we want to receive the feedback so that we can use it most effectively. Of course, we want to ask great questions. Great leaders ask really valuable questions. They use where, when, why, and how all the time. And then they use their ears and their mouth in the proportion that they've got them. So we listen more and we talk less. And when we do that, we enable this incredible person we've just spent all this time and energy hiring to really bring all of their great thoughts, all of their great innovations, all of their energy and passion to our business, right? So asking those great questions and then stepping back and listening really actively is important. And most of all, this is one thing I believe about being a great leader. You have to be authentic. You need to be yourself. So I work a lot uh, with my clients on what is authentic for them as a leader. And every single one of us is going to be different. Again, Kelly and I, we are total extroverts. We are high energy. We are high passion. We are loud and bright. And we've got a ton of great ideas. And the truth is, most of the time, we need to shut up. That's why it's called high voltage leadership, right? Because that's who I am. Um, and I need to embrace that. But I also need to understand that there are others out there that that isn't their style. Perhaps you are a bit more on the introverted side of the spectrum. Maybe you are more thoughtful. Maybe you like to listen more than you talk. That can be your superpower. And it is absolutely in your best interest to embrace who you are as an authentic leader, because that is what's going to help you be a truly effective CEO. Any thoughts on that in the chat, Kelly? Uh, no, we're just complimenting your workbook. And I just wanted to point out that it's almost 2.30. So really? I don't know. Well, yeah, we, we're just like enjoying ourselves so much here. So hey. Um, where are we at? Yeah, we're, we're like two slides away. So what I want to say is all of this is a work in progress. Um, when it comes to recruitment, nobody bats a thousand. You're going to, you're going to mess it up. It's not, it's not going to go perfectly. Um, you may hire the wrong person at moments in time. I worked for the national HR leader of the year here in Canada, and she too made bad hires. So you need to understand that this is not intended to be per like perfection is not an expectation here. In fact, it is highly likely that it'll never be perfect. And that is super duper. Okay. So what I do is I do some recruitment planning sessions. If you want to engage with me to work through some of this in more detail and get you set up, we can do that. I am a leadership coach. That is what I do. Love to coach female entrepreneurs, as Kelly knows. Um, so there's an opportunity for me to step in and help you with some expertise and go deeper on this so that you feel like you are really equipped uh, to do some recruiting. And again, hiring the right people is just needs to come with a clear vision, solid strategy, and a well thought out process, which is what I have given you a super high overview of today, given you a workbook with some of those pieces in it so you can start to work through them. You are, you've asked questions all along, but you, I would love it. If you would follow me, reach out to me. If you have questions that didn't get answered here today or that come up, while you're going through that workbook, the, this is where you can connect with me. My email and my phone number are in the workbook. You can send me a note. You can send me a text. Um, would love to answer any questions that you have. And I think that's it.
That's amazing. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for coming and bringing all of that information. And seriously, that workbook is incredible. It is do not lose that. Save it on your desktop. Like no matter where you're at in your thought process of hiring and growing at this point, know that you now have the plan laid out for you to follow step by step. And one thing that I just wanted to say, because like to acknowledge my own challenges, having gone through this, just so like we are (laughs) relatable here. It's it's hard. It's hard to think about letting go. It's hard to think about spending your money on another person of like reducing your own personal income of having someone on payroll of making sure you have enough money in the bank account to cover your payroll. There's the idea of, well, I want to wait till I have contracts in place. So I know that I have income coming in so that I know that I can afford, but maybe sometimes we have to take a risk. Like there's actually no right way and no perfect time and no exact anything, which sometimes when I say that, because that applies to literally like every part of business, sometimes when I say that, it's like, what? That sucks. And sometimes it's a relief to actually hear. Like there's no one way, no one size fits all, no like exact right time for you because it's a mixture of, you know, knowing the steps having a good idea and then checking in with your gut and feeling like now is now is the time to get started on this. And like yeah. some of us are more like, I want to do things right now. And we are like, okay, well, I want to hire in the next 30 days. But one thing I've learned from Lindsay too, is that it's, it's better to be thinking about this far in advance. Yes. And I will say if anybody here is looking to hire in a from Alberta. Um, There is a grant available right now. It's called the Alberta Jobs Now program. And uh, the government is offering up to 25% of a salary if you hire somebody as an employee part-time or full-time for at least 12 months, which is something that I've been able to access. And and actually I spoke to them um, because I have one person, my, my part-time employee is, has come through that. I spoke to them recently and they said, if you are even thinking about hiring somebody again, apply, and then you can always just remove your application. Yeah. It's not hard to apply for it. So I would really yeah. encourage that if, if anyone here is in Alberta. There's lots of programs, uh, you know, um, organizations, uh, governments around the world are trying to get people back to work. Yeah. I, I think the one, I want to say yes to all of that. And the one thing I want to add taking a strategic approach to this, no no matter what your mindset is. So if you are struggling with how am I going to let it go? I'm a bit of a control freak, or I don't know what I'm doing. I'm losing my mind. I don't even know what I would get them to do first. Stopping and taking the strategic approach, going right back to your business plan. What am I doing? Where am I going? What are the goals? What am I trying to create? That is really going to help you sort through some of that right from the start. It's going to give you confidence. It's going to give you clarity. And that, again, is what you need as you move into the CEO role in your business. You really embrace that leadership uh, and strategic mindset. Love this. Thank you so much. And um, save the chat if uh, if you want, because there's contact information in there. Uh, use the three dots to save the chat to your computer. This is the New Age business card. <laughs> Um, So you can connect with other people from this group today. And uh, hi, nice to see your face, Catherine. (laughs) Uh, Any final questions before we head off for the day? Oh, I will. I will say while you're formulating that. Well, no, go ahead, Catherine. No, I just wanted to jump in and say thank you. I was I was busy cooking and eating and typing, so I just didn't want to distract by having all of that going on on the screen. But thank you so very much. This was exactly what I needed to hear, uh, I, I took on a virtual assistant kind of a couple of months ago and yesterday was having a conversation with her and saying, she's like, well, we need to get it out there. We need to get an advert out and this, that and the other. And I was like, actually, no, we don't. I have not thought this through enough yet. I want to recruit the right person. I'm about to go away and I'm going to be in the States for about four weeks, middle of August to middle of September. I said, basically, I've missed my window to get someone in and on the ground for while I'm away. I'm going to have to work on this we can have all of the kind of the role spec and all of the kind of the process like you've said the planning it out can be ready and some of that can happen whilst I'm stateside but I said I I I haven't got the time for someone to come and shadow me on a job for me to see how they're using initiative for them to learn 
my style and the way that sort my space does professional organizing and decluttering and things and so I kind of really put the brakes on it yesterday she was like no no we need to get it out just see what happens I'm like no because I haven't got time this is like me going on the dating apps two weeks ago I'm completely overwhelmed now I ain't got time for it you know like Ella said I don't want the same thing with like 50 something people applying and I've got to wade through it all I said actually let's get it really concise and clear what am I trying to get who do I want what skills and then kind of really get a good quality of applications rather than just getting out there to tick something off the list so so thank you so much because you've got me excited again about the prospect of (laughs) recruiting rather than to like freaking out so (laughs) I love it. If Catherine, if you have any questions at all, please reach out to all of you, you know, please reach out to me and um, be happy to support you in developing that plan. Um, You know, I love recruitment. Not everybody does, but it, to me, it's a lot of fun and it can be really rewarding. Right, Kelly? Yes, Yes, it is exciting. (laughs) I'm glad that you came around to that at the end of the day, that it should feel exciting. Like all of the things that are like a little bit overwhelming and, and nerve wracking about it the idea of like, like the first day, even when I hired a student, I was like, a human works for me. Like I'm giving someone a purpose for the next four months. They come to this place and they work for what I want to create in the world. And that's amazing. It's a huge step in our businesses. It really is. This is a big, big step. Um, and you know, the most important thing is Kelly said, you're not alone. Like it, it is nerve wracking. It feels stressful and, and that that's okay. It should be because it's a big decision, right? Yeah. But there is a way to turn that nervous excitement into joyful excitement. And mm-hmm. that's through great strategy and great planning. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, before we go, I just wanted to let everyone here know um, of the, I dropped a link because we do have scheduled events for Entrepreneur School over the summer. We're slowing down just one session each month um, because holidays, et cetera. I'm actually going starting tomorrow. I'm actually hosting the next Entrepreneur School event, which will be taking place on July 27th. Um, I hope that it's actually there to register for. Uh, uh, No, but it will be. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and I will be talking about uh, getting results in your business, like taking action and how to actually stop just thinking about and consuming and doing uh, all the learning and all the things that happen. And honestly, that's one of the reasons that I started entrepreneur school is because I felt like we can get so overwhelmed following like shiny object syndrome and going down rabbit holes and Googling all these things that we know, like we need to develop all these skills in all these areas, but what is actually next and what is actually going to make a difference. And, and the purpose of entrepreneur school is to help like weed that out. And like, not that this is in a particular strategic order. It's just like, if this is the one thing that you're following, that is going to provide you opportunities to learn different aspects of growing a business then it's just less of having, it's less email subscriptions, it's less freebie downloads, it's less uh, in, in interfering with you actually taking action and implementing some of the things that you're learning. And so if you're here today, you're here for the right reason, you came because you actually needed to be here. And that's what I believe about all the sessions you'll be offered over the next months to come. Um, this is our fifth uh, session. All of the recordings from previous uh, trainers are on our website at uh, entrepreneurschool.ca. So please check us out. Follow us um, at uh, ksco underscore entrepreneur school on Instagram. And uh, let's stay connected and please share this with a friend if you found it valuable today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day and night if you're in the UK. <laughs> yes. Happy Bye, summer. Everybody. Bye.